Hello. Today I wanted to speak to you about blood sugar and how you can understand that each moment that you check your blood sugar, there's a story behind it. There's a complexity to the number. So many times we just look at one data point, be it blood sugar, or maybe it's a number on our scale, any data point, and we look at it just from the surface level, right? But I wanna add dimension to your understanding of blood sugars and what does that mean and all the things that you have available to you to really make a difference if someone is dealing with, for example, insulin resistance, pre-diabetes or diabetes. So let me pull up my notes here. Number one, really, you know, understanding blood sugar levels goes way beyond just understanding your food intake, which many people think about just food. Many, I've had patients come from, let's say, using a device that they bought online without real understanding of under, uh, blood sugar. And they were basically trying to starve themselves, trying to keep that blood sugar lower. They don't know what's normal for them. Let's say someone's non-diabetic. They're thinking blood sugar shouldn't go up at all. That's not the case. So but I'm not going to get into the nuances necessarily of understanding CGMs. I have a glucose mastermind. If you're interested in doing that, we'll be launching a, another group in February. We learn a lot <laughs> about blood sugars, deep diving into why someone becomes insulin resistant, how to overcome it, understanding CGMs. I prescribe a CGM. It's a really fun class. I actually have one of my one of my groups tonight. So I'm really looking forward to that. But back to the topic at hand. Let's understand the depth of a blood sugar number. And I want you to start thinking about these as data points. So let's say that you are wearing a CGM and you're seeing all sorts of fluctuations. You're just not sure what they mean. But let's start with let's say a fasting blood sugar. And you're seeing that fasting blood sugar, sometimes it's elevated, sometimes it's lower. And you're just not understanding, like I ate the same things, why is this number different? Well, that's because there's, again, there's complexity to that number. And your body is a very dynamic, incredible thing. And we need to understand that it's always reacting to its environment, internal and external. Our mind, right, can have a great effect. So let's start with number one. Number one, of course, is dietary choices, right? So Beyond the type of food, right, factors like meal timing, your portion sizes, and like food combinations will play a role. Uh, carbohydrate content, fiber intake, and the glycemic index of foods, or how much foods will make a blood sugar rise, can significantly influence your blood sugars, right? So it's more than just saying, oh, it's a banana. It's the banana in the context of what, right? What's the story of eating that banana? Is this someone who's a type one diabetic, type two diabetic, someone who's normal, who just hasn't eaten, has been fasting, someone who ate an hour ago, lots of different things. <clears throat> so that's why I wanted to want you to start thinking about this as a bigger picture. It's not a reductionist view, but as a whole. And next is physical activity, right? So exercise has a really profound uh, impact on blood sugar control. So both the intensity and the duration of physical activity can lower blood sugars by increasing your insulin sensitivity, right? And aiding in the glucose uptake by muscles. And it's really interesting to see what aerobic exercise will do versus anaerobic or resistance training, the timing of those. How, do you do it right after eating? Do you do it half an hour or more after eating, before bed, when you first wake up, before eating, all sorts of stuff. So again, this is really, really important to to note that exercise in and of itself can be a prescription for improving your blood sugar numbers. <clears throat> Next is stress and your emotional state. So stress, both physical and emotional, can affect blood sugar levels, right? So the body's stress response triggers the release of hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which really can increase your glucose levels. And to share a little story, I am not pre-diabetic, I'm not insulin resistant, I'm very insulin sensitive. But I have worn CGMs many, many times because I really want to understand what patients are going through. And I, you know, myself have found myself, I'm a great tool to understanding just what affects blood sugars in someone who's not a diabetic. So I had been, was wearing them, this happened this year, or well, <laughs> the last six months, I should say. And I would, had worn a CGM. It had been three hours since I had last eaten. And I watched a movie um, or series on World War II and it was really intense. And I love World War II. I love war history. I just think it's phenomenal how people came together and overcame such evil forces, basically. And I went to bed after watching that. 
and didn't think much of it, but I woke up around midnight and I had had a really vivid dream. I'm a very vivid dreamer. I remember my dreams. They can be a little scary sometimes. And this one was really intense. And it was basically the theme was World War II. And when I woke up, I was like almost in a sweat. I was like, whew, I'm glad that was a dream. But I just happened to look at my CGM data and it had my blood sugar had steadily risen to about 120 around midnight. And then I woke up and it precipitously dropped. So the stress of my subconscious dreaming caused <laughs> a rise in my blood sugar. I had never experienced that before. I hope to not experience again, but it made me very conscious of what I'm putting into my mind, right? So even just entertainment stress, I guess you could call it, can have an effect on your blood sugar. So now imagine the chronic stress that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we don't have a good tool set or a good way of dealing with this, or maybe it's a mindset or how our perspective on life and the stresses that come, because life is going to throw things at us, but we have a choice, right, of how we respond, how we perceive the stress, and that can have a huge impact on your blood sugar levels. So I just want to really stress that, that even if you're, quote unquote, a non-diabetic or someone who doesn't have diabetes or doesn't have insulin resistance, the stress still has an impact on your blood sugars, but also things like your blood pressure, the different hormones, and that can set you up for a cascade of events that could lead to some other type of illness. So anyway, I just want to share stress is really, really important. Um, next kind of is a great segue from my story is sleep quality and duration, right? So I think we understand that poor sleep or lack of sleep can really lead to higher cortisol levels, which in turn can increase your blood sugar levels. So good sleep hygiene is essential for maintaining balanced sugar uh, levels. So I just interviewed uh, Dr. Audrey Wells. Uh, that should be coming out on the 23rd, I believe. It's a great one. She's a sleep specialist. We talk all about sleep, not necessarily in the context of blood sugar control, but it's really a very interesting conversation about how you can improve your sleep quality. So I hope you check in with that. Next is hydration. We are mostly water, <laughs> right? So it's really important that we adequate, take adequate water intake, right? It's really crucial for maintaining blood sugar levels. Um, dehydration can lead to higher blood sugar concentrations. <clears throat> I don't want to go into necessarily the physiology, but just understand that we can also see other symptoms of dehydration, minor headaches, dizziness, fatigue. So making sure that you're maintaining um, a good hydration is important. And I would say anywhere between eight to 10 ounces in the first 10 to 12 hours of awake uh, period could be a good starting point. Now that's outside of exercise or other, ex uh, let's say higher exertional activities that would need to be adjusted according to what you're doing. But that's a good starting point. And of course, some people have indications where they need to restrict fluid intake and that's gonna to need to be dictated by your doctor. For example, someone has kidney disease or heart failure, that will need to be again, adjusted by your personal physician. Additionally, medication and illness. Yes, certain medications like steroids or certain um, anti-psychotic uh, drugs or psychiatric medications, that can affect your blood sugar levels. Um, illness and those um, causing inflammation or stress in the body can cause fluctuating blood sugar levels. I used to have a patient that she would call me and she's like, Dr. Marbus, I do believe I'm getting another UTI. She would know she was about to catch a UTI because that was her most common recurring issue that we were dealing with. When her blood sugars went from being fairly well maintained with diet and a little bit of medication, oral medication, to just blasting off like a rocket to 300. And she had no symptoms, no fever, no burning with urination, no urinary frequency. And sure enough, we'd check urine, it'd grow out E. coli, retreat her, blood sugars returned. <laughs> Who knew? So that was another indication. The body knows long before we're aware, consciously aware of what's going on. So I mean, I feel the need to, I want the urge to go down the, the whole point of like the rabbit hole of thoughts can cause stress, that can cause your blood sugar rise, but I'm going to resist. So moving on. <laughs> Hormonal changes. Well, being in my mid 50s now, I'll be 54 in October. Um, there's definitely some things that are occurring, right? So hormonal fluctuations, for example, in PCOS, menopause, puberty, 
these can have a great impact on blood sugar, insulin resistance, and different things. So really important to think about if you're seeing your blood sugar changes and you're like, I see, I'm eating the same, my weight's the same, what's going on? If you're going through some hormonal transition or something is changing, pregnancy, all of these things, please, please, please speak to your doctor about what's going on so they can give you a better light or feel free to make an appointment. I'm seeing patients across the country at drmarvis.com and I'm happy to help. Um, additionally is alcohol and caffeine uh, consumption, right? So alcohol can cause an initial increase in your blood sugar and that can be followed by a potential decrease. Caffeine on the hand may raise blood sugar levels in some people due to just to its stimulating effect and that increasing your um, sympathetic nervous system. So not everybody's gonna be affected that way, but some will. And then of course your environmental factors, right? So extreme temperatures and altitude uh, can affect how the body uses glucose, thereby uh, impacting your blood sugar levels. For example, a good test you could try is if you get into a hot shower, if you're wearing a CGM, you'll notice blood sugars rise. I saw that every single time I got in a shower, blood sugar rises on the CGM and then it came on down. So again, it just varies. So the whole point of all this and just kind of going through these nine different things is really important to understand that each blood sugar number has a story and you have to take this in context. It's all relative to the things that were happening before, your current state, your present, and looking at it as a story and not looking at it a judgment that you're feeling, oh no, my blood sugar is high, I messed up, I didn't eat this, I didn't do that. Mm -mm. This is a story. What you do is you look at the story and you learn from it. What's the moral of this story? What was the story of this number that allows you to make different choices? And maybe you can see a trend of an improving blood sugars in insulin resistance reversal. Really important. I wanted to share that with you because at the end of the day, um, we need to remove ourselves from judging the scale, blood sugars, whatever. And just know that this, these are data points and we can learn from them. All we have right now is our present moment in the, the moment to look at this blood sugar and say, I'm going to accept this number. I'm not going to get emotional about it. It's just a number. And that allows me to make different decisions moving forward. So I hope you found that helpful. I definitely wanted to highlight that we have the Healing Kitchen available. I'm also launching Overcoming Insulin Resistance and Lose Weight course with monthly coaching with me personally, um, probably in the next week or two. I'm almost done with it. It's a lot of work to get it all set up, but I'm really proud of this and I really hope you guys check it out. Um, I really want to help as many people as possible. So you'll have an ebook, you'll have a, the a recording course, and then you'll get monthly coaching from me where I can answer any questions that you have about your journey over the course of about 12 weeks. So Hope you guys are looking forward to that. As always, I'm available to see patients at drmarvis.com. I'm licensed in all 50 states and DC. And you uh, can order labs. We can take care of medications. I'm here to answer your questions, even if it's just one visit. If you want me to be a long-term doc, that's great too. So check it out. Healing Kitchen, Glucose Mastermind, Overcoming Insulin Resistance. Happy to serve you as a physician. Um, all sorts of things. So thanks everyone for listening. I hope you have a blessed rest of your day and I'll be back tomorrow. And we'll talk soon.